everyone, and welcome back to the Petros Podcast. This is episode 90 of the Petros Podcast. My name is Trisha Curtis, the CEO of Petros and the host of the Petros Podcast. And boy, do we have a special treat for you today because this is this episode 90. This is August 8th, 2023. Um, and we are it's Tuesday. We are seeing a lot of volatility um in the market, in the stock market, in the in the market in general, in the commodity space. But today's podcast is a unique podcast, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit with some caveats and some disclaimers because this is my podcast with Carl Rove. This was an in-person live sit-down interview that I did, uh, a chat with Carl Rove um, in um, at the Petroleum Alliance Oklahoma the Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma, their annual meeting that they do in Dallas, Texas every year. This was done in June and we, I timestamped that and talked about it. I typically, I, you know, honestly, I do avoid a lot of political conversations because I don't like to alienate people and I like to keep this podcast and the work that I do focused on on the task at hand. And I, I cover politics. Most folks know if you are a client of mine or you work with me, if you ask about politics, I certainly address it and I'm very honest about my opinions. Um, and I will say that I do not agree with Carl Rove on his politics. Um, and I want to caveat that by saying this is a great conversation. It's, it is a really good discussion and it's a good interview. And I think he brings up some good points. Um, however, I disagree with sort of when we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the presidency and we're talking about a the age and the, uh, you know, what, the age of Donald Trump versus the age of, of Joe Biden and how they're similar and basically they're the, at the same capacity. I don't think that's that's a accurate statement by any means. Um, there's obviously a lot of craziness with both the uh, in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. Um, but that all being said, Karl Rove is the is a uh, he is a Republican. He is the first politician or not the first politician, but the first American politician I've really had in the podcast. He claims that he's not a politician, that he's a political hack. Um, he was the former White House uh, deputy chief of staff for uh, George W. Bush, as well as his senior advisor. Um, he resigned in August of 2007. So um, he's a very interesting character. You've seen him on Fox News. You've seen him. You see him all over TV. Um, but I will say that, and this, this is not Chatham House rule. So anybody that attended the Petroleum Alliance of Oklahoma, the reason I think I need to give this caveat is because he was the uh, the speaker right before I spoke. Uh, Carl Rove spoke in the morning, and then Harold Hamm, and then I spoke right after that. Um, and so Carl Rowe gives a talk and it was pretty interesting because it was basically, I think I thought he was going to talk about politics and, you know, the state of the Republican Party and how various candidates viewed energy. Um, and instead, he talked about Trump's uh, papers and, and the documents case and all these papers. So I, I thought that was a little interesting. I did ask him directly about that, about why he was talking about that and not about all the other folks' papers that were running around D.C. Um, he was asked about China. And I will say that's where we disagree is that he's definitely he's definitely serious about China, but I think our approach and our tactics on China and um, how serious uh, many Republicans take the China issue, they may take it seriously, but I think just like many Democrats, uh, there are a lot of folks that make money off China or think that they're making money off China and want to be careful about being reelected in the future. Um, and so I think we have to be very conscious about that within politics. That's why I stick to the information as much as possible so that people can understand that for their data, for, for their data lives, but also their business. So with that, this is a really fantastic discussion. I mean, we talk about, this was done on June 8th. Um, this is a, you know, at the time, oil prices were $70 a barrel. Um, we talk about the very anti-oil and gas administration. Um, we talk about the nerdiness of the podcast. We talk about refineries. We talk about permits. Um, there's a lot of uh, back and forth in the conversation. Um, he's and not afraid to interrupt, as you'll as you'll hear. So I think it was it was great dialogue, good conversation. Uh, we talk about energy security. We talk about China. Uh, we talk about China and CO two emissions. We talk about the coal fired power generation. Um, and I mean, this isn't completely dissimilar from what you see on TV, but it's it's ver a very focused and very nerdy conversation. Um, and we also get into. Um, we also get into two things that I wanted to ask about, which was the Inflation Reduction Act, and if there was a change in administration, if there was anything that could be done about that to pull that back a little bit. And he gives some color and commentary on that. He thinks, yes, it can. And we also talk about DeSantis, um, who at the time was uh, somebody that was talked about quite a bit at that conference. Um, so we also talk about DeSantis and where he stands on energy. And obviously, Florida is not an energy-producing state. Um, he's DeSantis is pro-energy and pro-oil and gas, the, but does he know a whole lot about it is another question. And obviously, he he um, is not pro drilling on on offshore, uh, given it's it's offshore Florida, or, or according that is according to Carl Rove. So with that, um, it is a really really great discussion. I think you guys are going to enjoy it, um, and I'm happy to have all kinds of folks on the podcast and happy to have hard conversations. So um, I think that's great. But wanted to front load that now. Given where we're at today in the market, this is we've been on such a wild ride. And I was out last week, um, gave a short video on LinkedIn that you probably have seen. 
Um, but really wild ride. We've had oil prices really come up. We're hanging at this 82 and change level. And what we're seeing right now is where we have OPEC cutting. So we have the Saudis basically saying they're going to, they're maintaining these cuts. They're keeping oil prices propped up. We have China that's disinfl- deflationary right now. So that's a whole nother story that we'll get into and a whole nother problem in the market that's weighing on, that's weighing on demand, not just for, for oil and gas, but for copper as well. And then we have, uh, we have the, you know, supposedly the war in, not supposedly, it's actually happening, but the war in Ukraine and the war with Russia and Ukraine really ramping up. And we see volatility in the Black Sea. And that volatility in the Black Sea, when you see, um, when you see back and forth between Ukraine and Russia, is that's causing, um, that's causing oil prices to go up. So we saw that on Sunday. Um, anything going on the Black Sea, anything going on the waters is going to cause oil prices to go up. So you're seeing the geopolitical risk premium being, you know, it's, it's not actually driving oil prices higher right now, but it's basically adding to that weight of keeping prices higher, in addition to the fact that the backdrop against a, a more weakening economy. And you are really seeing right now. We are really seeing WTI and Brent really narrow. This is this is less than a about a three dollar spread right now with eighty seven uh, or sorry eighty two seventy four for for WTI eighty six oh four for Brent. We are seeing net gas at two seventy eight. We're still seeing net gas get pummeled. Um, we have Dutch TTF under ten dollars um, um, per MMBTU. Now the mortgage side, and I will be getting into this in future podcasts because we had Fed data come out uh, on on credit card debt, and if you saw some articles or headlines, U.S. credit card debt is over a trillion dollars. This is something I've been talking to clients a lot about. I've talked to a lot of folks in depth about this. Talked about it on the podcast. That trillions, a trillion dollars in credit card debt, in addition to auto loans, in addition to student loans, but particularly this credit card debt, where credit cards are being charged at 23% interest right now, is the ramifications for this are really huge. And it's telling you that when we hear this resilient consumer and people still spending, they are spending on their credit card, which means this is a false reality of how resilient the economy is and how um, how how resilient the consumer is and how resilient these households are. So that's exceptionally serious. It is a shoot to drop. We are, we are also seeing on the commercial real estate side, we're seeing WeWork basically saying WeWork is having massive problems. Now, WeWork was a company that was doing gangbusters, going amazing. They were where you basically come in and you rent an office space several years ago. That was great. Now that's obviously not so hot since COVID. But it really does show you how quickly trends can come in and qu- how quickly trends can go out. Um, you are seeing a lot of businesses start to say people need to come back. Zoom, of all of all companies, Zoom, the company that does the video calls, is basically saying they need more people come back into the office. And the reason we're seeing that is because productivity is down. People are not wanting to admit it, but they are realizing that people are not being as productive necessarily at home. And in addition to that commercial real estate piece, we are starting to see entities stop not even pay they're not even they haven't even hit the default but they're just not paying on so they're basically we're seeing folks walk away from commercial real estate before it has even imploded which means there is stuff left on banks balance sheet and that being said we have seen several we have saw several regional banks that their credit rating was downgrade or they were downgraded um so that's been weighing on the market that's what we've seen the last few days um and then last week we saw fitch actually downgrade u.s u.s um debt downgrade from AAA to AA+. Plus. Um, that modest downgrade, you saw the administration push back on that. Janet Yellen pushed back on that. Um, but I think that's, that's basically that the basis of that is on the potential gridlock in Washington and a halt um, to government activity in Washington, which is really problematic um, because we have, we have so much gridlock in D.C., and that is that is really partly why you're seeing yields be maintained so high. So we are seeing 30-year mortgages above 7%. That's a whole nother story we'll talk about for a second. Um, but we are seeing the 10-year yield above 4%. That's why that's why that 30-year mortgage is above is is above 7%. And so you have a statistic right now where you have a, a significant amount of homeowners who are having and, and a lot of folks who have lower mortgage rates than they have um, in their savings accounts. So if you have money in savings right now, you're probably getting a higher yield on that than your mortgage because most many many folks the bulk of mortgages were all refinanced when mortgages were were four percent or under and then you have a lot of folks that are still in the four or five six percent range um but now things are really completely gridlocked and if you listen to the video that i the short video i did on linkedin or if you've been anywhere and you're really paying attention to the real estate side if you go to someplace like la jolla if you go to san diego which is a completely unique spot in the world especially in terms of real estate it's still pretty gridlocked it's that people aren't people aren't moving in and out of the market um, because you have such high mortgage rates and because there is not a nearly a willingness to sell because they can't find another place so it's creating massive tightness that tightness in the space is creating is keeping housing prices maintained it's keeping housing prices rising it's keeping rental prices rising which is very very inflationary so when we talk about when I see all this optimism out of the Fed and everybody talking about lowering rates I really understand 
Where is that coming from? It is not based upon reality because if you're going to the grocery store, prices are still rising. And if you are, um, and yes, they're not rising at the level of, of, they're not rising at 10%, but they're still rising significantly well north of 5%. And then the rental costs or the housing costs and, and, um, and in, now energy prices are also rising. So with 83 WTI, that is inflationary. And the single biggest drive down in inflation has been this over 16% drop in inflation that we saw from energy prices. So that is a big, big problem for the Fed. Um, and I think so all this stuff going on within, you know, within OPEC trying to prop up prices, the Saudis trying to prop up prices, the volatility within the war in Ukraine, um, and the continued ramp up or escalation in that that's not going to help in terms of the these higher oil prices are definitely not going to help in terms of the inflation story in terms of those who think that the fed is going to have to is going to cut rates now the fed could cut rates if we actually do see recessionary territory and things start getting really bad so we definitely could see the fed going the other direction on rates um if if and when we start seeing the negative economic data. But as long as you have an inflationary story um, and you have a very tight labor market, which we do, I think you're gonna see at least have to see those, those Fed rates being maintained. Now, the flip side of that is that, so we, the backdrop is that if you're watching the stock market or you're following anything in the market, you see this, this, this continued sort of optimism that's always there. If you're following China, you are seeing a very different story. It is a very disinflationary story. You're seeing um, names like Country Garden, the real estate side, not, not being spoken about positively at all right now. There's some serious concerns on the real estate side. There's a lot of talk about the local government debt and the local government financing vehicles and all that debt being a problem. There's a there's a reason that China has not done the massive stimulus measures, the big infrastructure spending, um, that th th it's because they have so much debt and that, uh, yes, that can grow the economy, but can that really grow it if you're just building houses and then tearing them down? So the disinflationary side with China is big in that they're, um, basically their consumer price index are coming, in, are coming down. And that means that they essentially had a pop in terms of, you know, they ripped the bandaid off zero COVID. Yes, people went out, they went about, they were spending, but they're not they don't have a resilient job market. People are not hiring. The economy is not ripping and going gangbusters. It is in the big cities, um, but it's not otherwise. And so you're hearing, you hear a ton. And I mean, if you're following any Chinese media or you're really find, following Chinese podcasts, you hear a lot about the youth unemployment rate, which is exceptionally high. So they say it's north of 20%. It's probably way, way north of that. Um, so that's really high. It means you have a lot of young people that do not have jobs. You have a disinflationary story. When, that, when we talk about disinflation or prices not going up, that means the economy is not growing. And it also means that we, the rest of the world, are not buying stuff. And that does tell, you know, everybody's focused on this China story, but it's telling us a lot more about the rest of the world. So if we are not buying stuff, our demand from China is not as high. Now, that's partly China tensions, but it's also it's, it's largely more economic driven. So we have to be paying attention to that. And then if you're following copper prices or listening to anything about copper or commodities, you know, oil right now is a bit of an outlier because of the OPEC propping this up and the geopolitical risk premium that we have on, on prices. But when it comes to things like copper, copper's in everything, and it's a huge chunk of the infrastructure spend for China, right? Copper is a big portion of that. So if they're not having an infrastructure boom, the demand for copper is not going to be up there. Now, the big ramp up in prices that we saw for copper post-COVID 2020 was a lot of belief that, you know, all the stuff that we need for copper in terms of the energy transition. Now, a lot of that's hope and thinking and dreaming and potential spending in the future. And it has not equated, one, it hasn't actually equated to people adding more mines and it hasn't equated to prices either. So that's telling us something very, very different. So with that, folks, I think you've given a lot to chew on. Um, this is the stuff that I dive in very, very deeply with my clients. Um, so reach out on at uh, petroners.com um, and we're happy to chat about any of this anytime. Um, love the, the space is uh, it's crazy right now, um, but you can definitely be ahead of the curve and ahead of your peers. Um, and that's what folks are with Petronerds and, uh, and really been getting incredibly positive feedback from the, from the podcast, especially the, the podcast with Harold Ham. So hope you guys enjoyed this conversation with Carl Rove. It's really great. Really appreciate him taking the time and talk to you soon, folks. Bye. Hello, everyone. Hello, Carl Rove. I'm Trisha Curtis. So, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Pleasure to meet you. Um, and this is the Petronerds podcast. Um, so thank you so much the for The world joining. famous Petra Nerds podcast. The podcast. world famous Petra Nerds exactly. podcast. Absolutely. Um, soon to be more famous with this podcast. So, um, Carl, I actually have not had a politician on my podcast. So I've had folks from D.C., um, but you were the first politician I've had on the podcast. So. I, don't, I don't think I qualify to be a politician. I'm a political hack. Okay, well, Politicians hold office. I, right. I've never, never held office. 
All right, so a political hack, that's fine. Yeah, um, right. So former, uh, you worked in the former White House, you, or you worked with George W. Bush right. in the White House, and now you are, um, I assume you're a consultant, you're a lobbyist, you're working on all kinds of things. In well, I'm not a lobbyist. You're not uh, a lobbyist, sorry, I, that was listed on Yeah, that. no, no, I, uh, the internet I write lie. for the Wall Street Journal awesome. every Thursday. Mm -hmm. I'm a Fox News contributor, I write books, I give speeches, I'm a, involved in an interesting tech business, and then all of my politics I do as a volunteer, and. You know, take grenades, pull the pins, and throw them in various okay. places. Well, um, so as you know, this is it's pretty clear. It's petronerd. So we're going to talk about oil and there energy, we and we we'll go. talk about politics as well. And right now, oil's sitting at seventy seventy dollars and ninety eight cents. We saw sixty nine this morning for this potential right. Iran deal that apparently the White House has said they're not doing. Um, so I have a few questions. Uh, we're going to start with we're going to start with the administration and and oil and gas because I am um, happy to be on the record all the time and I think this is the the most um, anti domestic oh, yeah. oil and gas administration easily easily, easily we've ever yeah, had. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really interesting to me that um, we also it, it's kind of hard because I don't think we because we haven't been in this situation um, we have declines in federal permits um, and we just have this regulatory overhang which I do think influences the investment climate in this business and. Um, I also think that it, we, it's very politically divisive. I don't recall Democrats not being able to like oil and gas before. I mean, this is, you, you can't basically like oil and gas if you're a Democrat. And I think that gets really cumbersome, doesn't it, in the political sphere? Yeah, I, and look, we used to have, you know, sort of, uh, you know, particularly Louisiana and Democrats, Jay Bunnett Johnson, for example, a big uh, oil state producer. We had people from North Dakota, though not uh, when North Dakota is as big a producer as it is now, who were Democrats. But it's healthy to have, you know, a Henry Cuellar from South Texas in the House whose district is, um, you know, got a lot of energy production and full of Democrats. So it's healthy to have Democrats who would understand the importance understand of energy. And, yeah, understand energy, but they're getting fewer and far, far farther between. Well, okay, so understanding energy is a great point. And this is something I spend a ton of time in my business, just edu educating people, whether it's on market intelligence and helping CEOs and you know boards, or it's literally talking to folks on the podcast, mm -hmm. it's literally just educating them energy. And we seem to, I don't know if there's an actual deficit of hydrocarbon knowledge in the White House, I believe there is, um, or some of it's intentional. Um, but there does seem to be a yeah. severe lack of understanding about how, and I don't even call them fossil fuels, I call them traditional fuels, crude right. oil, natural gas and coal, right. Is there a, do they not understand them or do they, are they intentionally not understanding? Well, the answer is yes. So I, I don't think Joe Biden, President Biden, with all due respect, understands energy. I don't think he does. So if you want to talk about a deficit of information, I think we have a presidential deficit. But I think John Podesta and the others in the sort of green energy mafia that's in the White House, who actually are setting the policy, they, they have an ideology that is anti fossil fuels, anti-traditional energy. And they're, they're trying to drive America to a place that it cannot get without enormous damage to our economy and may not even be able to, to get to, you know, under the best of circumstances. But they don't care. Their object is to get from here to there and whatever the cost is to the American economy, the American family, the American worker, they really don't care. Um, so how has the, how, how is, I mean, this seems the wedge is huge in this of that and the divisiveness. Um, and it's very frustrating um, being someone who understands oil and gas, being third generation oil and gas, coming from Wyoming Ooh. and Northwest Colorado, that um, to get people to just understand where we're at for energy. And things like, I mean, I understand John Podesta, I understand the climate czars and John Kerry, and, and you know, right. they're a bit outside their mind in terms of energy. Interior Secretary, head of Absolutely. the BLM, EPA, yep. you name it. They're all of them. FERC, all of them. They've, 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 they've made certain that every one of those key positions is filled by somebody who shares the sort of the green energy ideology and a willingness to do whatever it takes to get to this you know, utopian vision that they have of the future. So how is it though that, um, and I think we struggle with this in the oil and gas industry a lot, because okay. I think there's a deficit in, in some cases in leadership in oil and gas as well, to willing to even be talking possibly about oil and gas, because everyone sort of wants to duck and cover or talk about the energy mm -hmm. transition. Why haven't, why hasn't been that Republicans have been able to, um, I mean, energy security should be a pretty bipartisan issue, mm -hmm. as is China. 
And I think energy security in China, energy actually in China are really big deals, but we don't seem to talk about them together. Mm. Most folks don't seem to understand that all of the, almost all the solar panels we're getting come from China. Right. Um, the Biden administration seems to be perfectly okay that this is coming from not just uh, forced labor, which is horrible, um, and free labor, partly why they're so cheap, but also from coal-fired power generation. So it's right. not like they've got a clean life cycle on them. And, um, and that we're basically just outsourcing everything to China for yeah. this. Yeah. And it seems to be a double-edged sort of, we're empowered the Communist Party and we are also um, getting unreliable forms of energy. Yeah. Um, why has the Republican Party and, and just and even centrists and independents not sort of driven this? Driven this well, line? I think they do try and drive it. I mean, we don't drive it perhaps as effectively as we, we, we'd like to because we don't control the media. I mean, I think about it. The New York Times, Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS, they, you know, those people, you know, I, I don't want to call into question their motives, but they all have the same lifestyle. They come from the same places. Uh, they, the journalists tend to go to the same colleges. They've got the same mindset. So the fact is, is think about us. The United States of America is the only major industrialized country in the world that has actually reduced the amount of greenhouse gases while growing its economy. Everybody else either is growing their economy and increasing their, their levels of greenhouse gas emissions, or the only way that they can reduce their greenhouse gas emissions is to impoverish their economy. And yet we don't talk about it. Yep. You know, we just don't talk about it as a country. And when people get, you know, when people talk about, you know, okay, I'm concerned. I want an insurance policy. If global warming is true, et cetera. Well, then they ought to be doing what we do in the United States, which is we produce energy in a most efficient and most environmentally sensitive way. And then, and, and here we are. We got Venezuela. Who thinks they're doing it right? China. They're building a, a coal-fired plant a week, a week. And, and that's supposed to be, okay, great. You, 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 wanna, you wanna have the world be better in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, then let's, let's use real good science and let's use real good economics and do it when and where we should and how we should, and that's how we do it in the United States. So on China, you're right about this, this they're building coal-fired power plant every week, and people say that, and I, I always think, if you actually break down the numbers, we have, um, I mean, they have like 8,500 80, 8, terawatt hours of power generation. Mm -hmm. They added over 1,000 terawatt hours of coal-fired power generation last year alone. Last year. We don't even have 1,000 terawatt right, hours of coal-fired right. power generation and, and, and look, in the U.S. And anybody who thinks they run their plants as efficiently Absolutely and not. as environmentally right. sensitive as we do is kidding themselves. Right. Their, their, their object is to dominate the world economy, come, come what may, in any way, shape, or form they can. So they don't give a crap about greenhouse gas emissions. They're, they're, they go to the international meetings and they talk, but why is it that, that, that their, their economy is, isn't supposed to beggar itself like we are? Because they, they've got until you know, 2030 or 2035 or 2040 or 2050, depending on what agreement you look at, before they even have to start showing any reductions. Well, they're not going to. Then they're not going to. We, if you Let's know not any, kid ourselves. If you know any Chinese history, you know that they kind of just throw out dates yeah, for right, willy-nilly. Right, right, right. And no one's, right, nothing exactly, sticks. Exactly. Um, although Taiwan seems to be something they are interested in, um, probably sooner than later. But that being said on, on coal, is that, you know, I would say that if you're, if you're serious about CO2 emissions, and I think this is where the oil and gas industry, if you meet engineers, you'll understand this very quickly, is they understand the problem. Okay, you want to lower CO2 emissions, they're engineers, they work this back on. Right. Okay, right. let's do this. Let's right. shove a bunch of natural gas in the system. Right. And let's solve it. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have to address China. But nobody, we just don't talk yeah, about China. No. And China's CO2 emissions go up, ours go down. We're the largest oil and gas producer in the entire world. The reason ours have gone down, to your point, is because we produce 124 billion cubic feet per day of natural gas, yep. and we're using it for power generation. That's reduced our emissions. And we're yeah. the only democratic, one of the you know, few democratic countries, and, and we're the largest oil and gas producer in the world. And that's an amazing, amazing feat because we have that rule of law. Um, so it is really disheartening for me in the town where I'm from, Craig, Colorado, that they're shutting down these uh, coal-fired power plants um, with no answer to yeah, yeah. where's the power going to come from. And in the name of you know, helping the environment, which yeah. is 0.3% is Colorado for global emissions, and it's and when you're looking at China, you're thinking, I think you would truly, and I say this a little bit, uh, uh, che you know, cheeky, you would have to go to war with China to solve the CO2 emissions problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're not serious about it, as you say. And this is one of the amazing things. Think about it. We burn coal, but we burn it more sensitively for the environment than any country in the world. Because we have a rule of law. Because we have the rule of law. Nuclear power. 
this, think about it. I mean, you, you want to talk about something that's in zero emissions, there it is. And the Germans, what are they doing? Shutting down their power plants before those plants have come to, their, to, their, to the end of their useful life. And why? Because again, we're being driven by an ideology that says we've got to somehow get to green power, which is, you know, not, what, what, what's, what's wrong with nuclear? You know, France is, France is almost entirely nuclear. And Germany used to have a substantial amount from, from, from nuclear. And, and then they got hooked on Russian gas, and suddenly, you know, they started cutting off the, the, the nuclear plants, the coal-fired plants, and becoming dependent upon an autocrat whose object was to dominate Europe. Mm -hmm. With so. 16 BCF a day of pipeline imports, right. um, it's right. basically how, how to start a right. war is, right. Is, right. is this. Yeah, I'll be showing this chart tomorrow that shows the consumption of natural gas for Europe and the production of natural gas for Europe, which is down. Well, think, think, th 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 this, is, this is the one thing that gets me, too. Think about it, the reserves that are there. I mean, in England. Oh, it's, yeah. In Poland. Yeah. The in, in the Czech Republic, Slovakia. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're talking about countries that have a chance to, to become in net energy producers. And yet, the, again, this ideology of, you know, we've got to, we, we can't use traditional fuels, we've got to be green, we've got to have wind and solar, it's baloney. So how does that, how does that get solved? You know, I think if you talk to industry executives or folks in the industry, and I think maybe politicians as well, but I'd love to, under, you know, get your take on this. How do we fix this? You know, I'm always a, I like to solve problems. I like to help businesses. I like to help companies. Well, and, you know, when I think about education, I mean, I was just talking to my Uber driver. You know, I say it's, this is bottom up and top down and one Uber ride at a time and telling people, and he, <laughs> we talked about China and solar panels. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, uh, you're saying that we don't have the media, that the, the you know, conservatives or, or energy or whatever doesn't have how do we solve this severe energy problem if, if we can't educate people? Well, you know, you're going to have to spend money. Like API has got a good, a good, pro, a good programs. But look, at the end of it the day, be it could be better. But at the end of the day, what we've got to do is elect people who, who will put people in office who will have a sensible regulatory environment. I mean, think about the hostility towards the energy industry from people whose job it is not to destroy the energy industry, but to regulate it in a sensible fashion. That's out the window. I mean, think about how difficult, one of the things that gets me is how slow they are to approve infrastructure projects in the Permian Basin where the object is, let's stop flaring gas, give us permission to put in place the pipelines that will gather that gas and turn it, and turn it into, a, you know, a, a, a power plant rather than just flaring it off in the mid, you know, in the, in the, uh, 24 hours a day. And, and what is the administration doing? They're slow playing infrastructure projects. That started from actually with day one of yeah. this administration. I don't think a lot of people appreciate how, you know, how big of a change this was politically of day one by the administration, the acting secretary of interior put out this, this order um, and that, that order banned all permitting, you know, stopped mm -hmm. all permitting. Mm -hmm. And it really impacted the people who were actually, there were people who were trying to not flare and they right. couldn't because they couldn't do anything that was, they, 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 they just couldn't right. actually build or, or do anything. So it put everybody in a bind and it really put the industry on the wrong foot yeah. because you have two months of zero permits. They actually re pulled back permits that were given to them on, on that day in January. They pulled them all back. And then it was, uh, that was obviously all political and they were trying to do something. And, and, look, they, and, and, and it's everywhere. You know, people are, they take small refiners. We've got a, a group, small refiners around the country. Yep. And when they passed the law setting, it, setting up you know, standards regarding pollution and environmental constraints, they said, okay, small refineries will be able to, to get up, buy offsets. And if there are no offsets available in the marketplace, then they will be able to get a forbearance for a period of time until the permits become available again, until somebody you know, pro provides an offset. Now, this administration went in and said to small refiners, okay, we're going to, not only are we not going to give you any more forbearance, if you can't go out in the marketplace and buy an offset, we don't care, we're going to fine you. In fact, we're going to go back two years or three years and take all the forbearances that we gave and retract them, and you now owe us that. And this is the same time that we are seeing significant inflation, and one of the things driving inflation is the cost of, of energy. And so what are they doing? They're making it more costly and, dry, and making it more difficult too. I mean, a lot of these small refineries are away from the oil patch. They're in you know, Alabama or they're in Nevada where, where there's no nearby production, but that's the, that's the place where people are getting their, their, their gasoline. Yeah, absolutely. And we've seen, um, I mean, the refineries are a whole nerdy, wonderful topic because I think 
You know, this, I hope you understand, you're a little weird being so nerdy about refineries and energy. This is a little weird. I'm happy you're doing it. Very nice. Good, good. Keep up at it. We I mean, it. well, I, one of the things a lot of people don't appreciate is like why we've had such high diesel prices is because yeah. we lost we lost over a million barrels a day refining capacity during COVID in the U.S. Right. Partly a lot of that was led by California and a, a right. really harsh regulatory environment called California that's very anti oil and gas. And when you lose this refining capacity, refineries are like restaurants. They're pretty thin margin business. Yep. And so you yep. have to keep up. And when the Biden administration, you know, writes these letters to Exxon and Chevron and says, you know, you're taking all these profits. I mean, the, this is where we as an industry and, and folks have to help educate people is that, you know, the <laughs> refiner, it doesn't work this way. It's not like they, I mean, they buy the barrel of crude oil, right. they refine it, and they sell it to the market. Right. And we have very this, thin margins. Very thin margins. And we still have this big gap between diesel prices and gasoline prices. Mm -hmm. And you see this more exacerbated, you know, when refiners go out or on the East Coast, but it's really problematic. Okay. And that's actually all over the world. And then we had a call on diesel when we we're shipping all this LNG to Europe because we're. <laughs> A lot of these ships are run by diesel, so then you pulled it more diesel out. And these have huge, big global ramifications yeah. that we feel as consumers all the time. Yeah. And the other knock-on is the inflation that you brought up. And I think what really frustrates me is there's something called the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which just... The, I call it the so-called Inflation Reduction it's, Act. It's unnerving to me that you can call something that involves so much spending Inflation Reduction Act, because yeah. it's not, and it involves so much spending. And when you spend money on renewables, crappy forms of energy that are poor forms of power generation and lower BTU, you know, uh, lower energy content that we subsidize so heavily to get it into the grid and that they're intermittent and they're not reliable, it's, it's literally inherently inflationary just by the spending you're doing it, but also because you have to subsidize it so yeah. much to get the damn solar power into this light bulb. Right. And, it, and then you have to build out all those transmission lines. The repercussions of this are massive. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, do you think, and a lot of people ask this in DC, and whenever I go to DC, we hear it a lot, especially in energy security. If there was a change in administration, is there any chance that we can roll back or repeal some of this inflation reduction? Oh, absolutely, reduction? absolutely. Okay, yeah. how is that? Well, we uh, first of all, because you, you, you have a new administration and they have to go through a budget process. And in the budget process, either by changing the amounts of money that you're spending or putting riders in there that drive policy, you can, you can affect things like that. Okay. And, 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 and the regulatory environment, I mean, the, a large amount of this is being done by regulators. But yes, we can, we can roll back things in the Inflation Reduction Act. Okay. And is some of that, if we... If some of that was rolled back, um, I assume, to me, I think a lot of its chunks will get spent, right? There'll be hundreds of billions and billions of dollars spent, but it won't actually get into the grid. So I think the easiest form, which you see, is that we build out a bunch of uh, electric charging stations. That's always the easiest one to do, right? You build out all these charging stations. We have a Tesla charging station in Craig, Colorado. I've never seen anyone charged into it, but it does exist. Um, but you build out these charging stations, you have them all over the place, but that's really, <laughs> this is also supporting China and sure. supporting forced labor and all kinds of things because almost all these electric vehicles, almost all the batteries, the entire supply chain for the electric vehicle battery is uh, completely comes from China. So we build all this stuff, we have to buy all these renew we, these EVs, and then yes, we have electric vehicle charging stations, but they're predominantly run on coal. And um, so you're plugging your, your plug in your car and so you're not really moving the needle on anything. Yeah, it has to come from someplace. And you are, I don't, our grid can't handle it. Mm. I mean, I was looking down my neighborhood in, in Denver, Colorado and taking photos that I need to put in this presentation tomorrow and I was thinking, if all these cars on the road, because my F-150 can barely fit in between these cars, if all these cars had to be plugged in, do you imagine the people tripping on the street with these cords coming into their garage? I mean, oh, yeah. it would be ridiculous. Well, and also think about this. We have this tremendous system of interstate highways funded by the gas tax. And so now we have vehicles yep. in there, fortunately a very small part of the fleet, but they're riding for free. They're, 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 they're chewing up the highways. They're requiring, they're causing things that have to be kept up and maintained. Absolutely. Or new highways to be built, the capacity to take all these new cars on the road. And they're not paying their fair share. Now in Texas, we're doing oh, something about that, it. That fair share, look at that. Yeah, oh, we're got doing, that quote in there. Yeah, nice. we're doing something about it. I mean, we're now going to charge, uh, if you've got an EV, you're going to have to pay a couple of hundred dollars a year, which is roughly comparable to what you'd be doing if you were paying a gas tax and if you were driving a certain, you know, sort of average, average number of miles. But you're now going to have to pay that into the, into the, highway, into the highway trust fund. 
Well, I think that's a great point. Um, I also think that it's, it's sort of this reality of, there's a lot of hypocrisy in, in, um, in green energy, but particularly, I mean, no, I always tell people no energy is free. Um, and there's something in Europe where if it's, they call it renewable, they call, um, if they're burning trash or they're burning, um, they're burning wood or wood pellets for power generation, it does not actually get counted in the CO2 emissions, which is insane because it is, it is emitting CO2, but it's not counted on that. Um, but except from that- Much higher levels than oh, if they were doing natural gas. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. And, and not as efficient. And, right. and I'm all for, you know, I, I'm not anti-coal. Um, you know, I come from a, a coal town and I think they're really, it's extremely, at, for energy security, you can pick this up, you can shovel it, you can stick it next to a power plant. We didn't even have to use it. We can just have it for energy security as backups, right. which we should actually have all of the country. But that being said, I know we only have a few minutes left and I have to ask, so on, we talked a little about the Biden administration, lack of understanding there. So in the political world, we have a, uh, a, crazy, uh, a, a crazy candidacy process going on, both on, from the left and the right. right. Um, so on energy policy, because I, I want to sort of stick to that, where do the main guys, I mean, it's obviously we have Nikki Haley um, and we've got lots of people in the race and we've got DeSantis and we've got Trump. I know where Trump stands on energy policy. He's actually pretty articulate on the strategic petroleum reserve. Um, he was so pro oil and gas that we had pretty low oil and gas prices in this country. Um, but I don't know where DeSantis stands on energy. Look, and he's I, not from an energy producing no, state. No, he, so he, he isn't. He's got one strike against him, which he's the governor of Florida. So therefore, he must oppose uh, uh, exploration off the Florida coastline. But other than that, every one of the Republican candidates is going to have a sensible view of energy. Every one. And the problem is, is that we've got one Democrat candidate today, and he does not have a sensible attitude, sensible policy towards energy. Now he doesn't understand it. You know, he was the guy who said that we're going to have no more oil and gas drilling in America when he was a candidate because he thought that would sound and good. And ban fracking. And ban fracking. And but 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 you know, once he got into the, you know office, he realized he couldn't exactly do that. But he put people in charge who are doing all kinds of bad things. And and I don't see a Democrat out there. You know, you think about it. Polis of Colorado should be pro-energy, but his, his administration has done a oh, lot. He's a, he's to, he's he can very, say the right he's, things, but he does the wrong things. Yes. You know, uh, Gavin Newsom wants to run for president. We know where he's coming from. Whitmer is not an energy state, but I, she sounds bad on it. Uh, Cooper of North Carolina, Murphy of New Jersey, you know, the closest we could get to a Democrat who might understand energy is Mitch Landry, the former mayor of New Orleans, the former lieutenant governor, whom a lot of the Clinton people want to have run for president. But right now we've got a Democrat who's, you know, if I were a betting man, I'd bet that he would be the nominee of the Democratic Party, but I'd, I'd, I'd take the field against him, which sounds strange. I don't think we're going to end up with Joe Biden at the age of 82 running for president. I mean, there's a whole other thing on that, which I, I do have to say, and I just mentioned it in my podcast recently because I am I am pretty frustrated that we have somebody, it's not that age doesn't bother me, but uh, the ability to string words together, um, yeah. and I think it's seriously, I can't imagine that. I, I watch Bloomberg and CNBC, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, and no one criticizes this, our president for um, when, he's, when he messes up. I did today in my Wall Street Journal column. Look, I, 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 with all due respect, I to him. I've worked in that place for seven mm -hmm. years. I know what it demands of, of the I president. Can, absolutely. Every single president. Take a look at the picture of the president when he comes into yep. office it and then when you. he leaves. It ages you. So if you were 80, 80 today and about ready to turn 81 uh, this fall and turn 82 shortly after the next election and you're having difficulty stringing together two sentences and they have to have a light schedule for you and, and even then you, you, know, you fall right. down, can't figure out right. where you are, say weird things. He ain't going to get better. No. And 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 and, and the, the demands of and the demands, demands of, of the job. And oh just, yeah. The demands of the job are one thing, but then to even go through campaigning oh, and no, go he's through not, debates. And he's not going to campaign. He's going to try and replicate the, the 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 2020 campaign from the basement. Only this time around, it'll be from the Oval Office. But but even if he were able to do, even if he were able to mount a campaign, I, I know that what we all age, and and the ages from 82 to 86 are not the high points of our life when we're at our mental, our mental and physical peak. They aren't. And our country faces too big a set of challenges. With all due respect, a 78-year-old who would be 82 uh, is not, not much better in, in, in the form of President Trump. And the country demands that we come to a point in history. We came to this point in I might disagree on the yeah, how well, much you bet. the yeah, but, differences there. Yeah. Yeah. We came to this point in 1960. We had a good president, Dwight Eisenhower, but he was born in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And the American people said, we want to pick from one of these two young veterans of World War II, both of them in their early to mid 40s, 
John Kennedy and Richard Nixon. And for the next 32 years, every president of the United States was a member of the greatest generation until the defeat of George H.W. Bush in 1992. And since then, we've been governed by men who were, who were members of the baby boomer generation, with mm -hmm. the exception of Biden, who's from the generation before the baby mm -hmm. boomers, the so-called silent generation. I don't like long and 32 years. And I think we're just at sort of an inflection point where the American people are gonna end up saying, you know what, we, we want somebody younger. But we didn't, I mean, and I say uh, we, I, the country didn't flip in the midterms when they, most people thought they should, on, when it came to the economy, when it came to energy, and will, will that flip in this time? Maybe well, look, it, it, it pr proves something. If you have lousy candidates, you have lousy results. And we had lousy candidates running places like Arizona and Elton, Georgia, and places that we should have won. And where we had good candidates, Ohio, think about it. We had a good candidate for governor, the incumbent governor wins by 25 points in what used to be a swing state. And so does every other Republican statewide candidate wins by between 18 and 24 points, except for the sort of really sort of not so good candidate for the U.S. Senate who wins by seven. And then when Arizona, we have the Republican tra state treasurer, Asian American uh, woman who's a former state legislator, runs several hundred thousand votes ahead of the, of the U.S. Senate candidate and several hundred thousand votes ahead of the Republican candidate for governor. The bottom of the ticket is running ahead of the top. And it's because independent voters said, you know what, I want to vote for somebody who's sort of center-right sensible, but I'm not going to vote for a nut and a lunatic. And we so, have too many lunatics. So, um, and I know where you stand on these issues, and because this is an energy podcast and I know you need to run, I want to close with, with energy commentary right. on this. Because you made the comment before that we don't have the, that the, um, the Republicans and sort of the centrist view does not have the media, right? That this is controlled. So right. you have a, and you, and you do hear a lot. I mean, I talk about this a lot on Bloomberg, CNBC. It doesn't no matter what you're listening to. There's a very deep uh, sense of on, on the energy transition. And so it's very, actually really hard for even yeah. the general investor, retail investor to understand energy adequately. But when it comes to this, then how, how does this get pushed back? Other than you said, get, 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 API, get, get, like, get good candidates who can go out there and say, you know what? Because look, the American people were, are with us. Do you think that the American people are saying, yeah, let's, let's, have, let, let's, let's make it really impossible to drive our automobiles by artificially driving up the cost of gasoline? No, I know the American gasoline. people. I know the American people. So, and they actually, I can tell you every single Uber driver takes the, their chance to listen to me. And when I talk to people, people yeah, listen. Yeah. Even if they don't want so, to So the best thing is to get people who, say, who understand that engaging on energy issues is good politics. People are willing to go out there and say, you know what, we need, to, we need to be energy independent. And when we're energy independent, we can show the world how this ought to be done. All right. Well, you send those politicians my way and I'll educate them. So. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Carl. Thanks. It's a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thanks, thanks for having thank me. Thank you.